They, uh, <laughs> the answer is they are doing half squats. <laughs> you haven't, you haven't seen any APF meat videos on the internet. From the global headquarters of the Asgard Company in beautiful downtown Wichita Falls, Texas. From the finest mind in the modern fitness industry, the one true voice of the strength and conditioning profession, the most important podcast on the internet, ladies and gentlemen, Starting Strength Radio. Welcome back to Starting Strength Radio. This is one of those wonderful weeks where we're going to take your questions off of Speak Up. We're going to address them in painstaking detail. Now, we're not going to do this like we do Ask Rip which is we take the stupidest questions we can possibly find and have fun with stupid questions. But this time, we're going to treat you like the intelligent adults that we know you all are. And if the question is stupid, we're not going to even deal with it. We're going to pretend like you didn't say that, all right? But what we are going to do is actually look at some of this shit. So, ready? Ready? Okay, this is again this is from Speak Up, right? What's the web address so they know where to where to do this? It's on the forum. It's on the forum on the on the Q and A. Where it's on a sticky. Where is it? On your Q and A. Somewhere on my Q and A. They gotta be smart enough to find it <laughs> before they can post. Okay, that's the reason. That's the prerequisite. That's the prereq. Starting strength radio Q and A. And they click on and the speak up address for the posting the questions. And then you post a question and everybody else reads it, gets to vote on whether it's a stupid question or not. So if it's an incredibly stupid question, I don't even see it. So this prevents some of the confusion that might be associated with me dealing with stupid questions. So we're just going to deal with highly intelligent questions here. Okay. Question number one. Miles asks, due to a lack of shoulder flexibility, I have trouble getting my arms into the correct position in both low and high bar squat. Forcing myself into the correct position resulted in the impingement of my right shoulder last August. To avoid this happening again, I started to train using a cambered spider squat bar to try to allow my shoulder to heal. I have now started to try to increase my shoulder flexibility by doing shoulder dislocates and various other stretches. However, doing this has brought a lot of pain back in my elbows, similar to how it felt before the impingement occurred. Do you have any advice on how to improve my shoulder health to allow me to get under the bar again to squat properly? And do you think the spider bar is a suitable substitute for high-low bar squats? Kind regards. Thing number one, I don't have the slightest idea what a spider bar is. Do you guys know what a spider, you ever heard of this? Never heard of it. I've never heard the word uttered it out loud before. I have no idea what it is. And, you know, I mean, if the manufacturer had bothered to send me one, maybe I'd have an opinion on it. But I don't have the slightest idea what that even is. I'm assuming it's different than the safety squat bar. We've got one of those. Yeah, looks, like. <clears throat> looks like a safety squat it's bar. Well, I, you know, a safety squat bar is, uh, let's just assume it's kind of the same as a safety squat bar. All right. Uh, a safety squat bar is uh, a different type of squat than a low bar squat. It's more closely uh, similar to a high bar squat in that the back angle is the most important thing uh, that we are going to talk about with respect to the squat. One of these shows coming up here pretty soon, we're, we're going to go into great length and great detail on the mechanics of the squat, similar to the, the way we treat this topic on Saturday morning at the seminar. And, uh, and I'll explain all of the squat mechanics during, during that discussion. But right now, let's just suffice it to say that uh, if your back angle is more vertical, as is required in a high bar squat and apparently – uh, this safety bar squat you're talking about, and uh, certainly uh, as vertical as is is required of a front squat because the front squat you have to have a vertical back angle on the front squat or the bar falls in the floor and it's no longer a squat, right? When the bar is in the floor, you're not squatting it. So the the high bar squat, safety squat bar squat is uh, more similar in in mechanics 
in terms of the use of the hips and the knees uh, than uh, a low bar squat, which is performed with a much more horizontal back angle. Intentionally so, because of what we're trying to accomplish by training the most muscle mass over the longest effective range of motion when we squat. Uh, but the the bigger question here is your shoulders, Miles. And I'll tell you, you didn't tell me how old you were. Uh, you didn't give me an injury history or anything like that. So. Typically, when we hear reports of uh, bony impingement in the shoulders and uh, an inability to stretch into the low bar squat position, we're hearing from someone who is an older trainee or someone who's had repeated shoulder injuries, impact injuries that cause bony overgrowth in the shoulder. Now, listen, if you've got bony shoulder impingement, osteoarthritis in your shoulders, you can't go into the low bar position. You can't do it. You can't stretch bones. Okay? So repeatedly trying to jam yourself down into a low bar squat position uh, after having tried it for about four weeks and it not improving at all is probably indicative of bony changes in your shoulder geometry that are not going to be conducive to allowing you to do a low bar squat. If you can do the high bar squat, that's what you do. If you have to do a safety squat bar squat, that's what you do. But don't keep jamming yourself down into a low bar squat if it won't go, because that's dumb. You, you're not going to make it happen if you've got bony geometry problems in your shoulder joint. It happens all the time. I've got several guys in the gym that have to do high bar squats. And especially after a shoulder injury, it may be necessary to high bar squat or safety squat bar squat for quite some time until the injury heals. But if it's, if it's osteoarthritis, if it's bony arthritis in the shoulder, it's not an injury and it's not going to heal. So quit aggravating it because you're not going to get anything productive accomplished. Okay, next guy is Anonymous. Now, isn't that the guy that wrote the story of O? I think so. I think it's a famous author. What are you listening to the podcast for? It's also a group of hackers. Anonymous is a group of hackers. Do you think a group of hackers wrote this question? Maybe they're strength training now. Could be, man. Strength training is getting popular among the hacking community. <laughs> Maybe that means they'll leave us the fuck alone. <laughs> be better if they would all right at this stage of my career at this stage of your career i gotta read the question not interpret it for you at this stage of your career do you see yourself more as a coach or as a writer i ask because if you hadn't written starting strength it is likely your influence and knowledge would not have reached a much wider wider audience well that's obviously true your coaching today might be limited to the walls of WFAC if you hadn't sat down to write, undertake the project that would become Starting Strength. That's obviously true. The book gave you the credibility to then utilize YouTube and new media effectively. That's obviously true. I see you now as a writer first and a strength coach second. Agree or disagree? Well, I guess since you, you know, made four true statements then right in a row, one after the other that I can't disagree with, I guess I agree I'm probably – a writer first and a strength coach second. Uh, the coaching I do, I don't, I don't do personal training at the gym. I don't take clients. I don't have any clients. I'm gone all the time, and I, I don't have the uh, schedule uh, that would permit me to handle personal training clients. So I don't, I don't do that anymore. Got a couple of guys at night that train with me late that I coach. Uh, and, of course, I coach uh, quite extensively in seminars on the weekends. When we're, we're doing seminars, I handle the around-the-room coaching. So uh, I am still active in coaching, but as you correctly point out, I really am more of a writer than anything now. I don't depend on uh, billing hours for coaching to, for my living, so I'm, I'm primarily a writer. And... Uh, that, uh, I hope, is a satisfying answer to you. Uh, because there, there's no other conclusion. You're absolutely right. Cade asks, 
What was it like to hang out and train with Bill Starr? Are there any important highlights starting strength followers need to know from his book, Defying Gravity? Well, Bill wrote Defying Gravity. He was writing Defying Gravity when I first met him in 1979. Uh, I met Bill here in Wichita Falls. Uh, he was uh, in town. Uh, we had a tornado in 1979 in April, April the 10th. F5 tornado in Wichita Falls. And it destroyed one-fourth of all the structures. The buildings in Wichita Falls were destroyed in that tornado. It was quite a blow to the community. And uh, things were tied around here for quite a while. And uh, Bill was in town taking care of his daughter, Christy Lou, who was uh, injured in the tornado. And while he was here in town, he was... Uh, he was training, and I was training back and forth at the time between, I was working out back and forth between uh, the downtown YMCA and uh, Midwestern University's weight room. And I first ran into him at Midwestern in the weight room, and this is the first guy that I'd ever run into in the, in the weight room that actually seemed to know what the hell was going on. And uh, being a young kid, I was... Oh, 23 at the time, and uh, I had uh, uh, I had uh, just been hanging around up there trying to get some stuff done. Didn't know what the hell was going on, and Bill kind of took me under his uh, advisement and showed me some important things to do about squat depth and and this sort of thing. Not an extensive education in technique because Bill wasn't really a, a technique coach in the sense that I do it now. But now how old were you? Uh, I was 23. 23. I was 23. This, is, this would have been June or July of 1979. I was 23 years old. And uh, <clears throat> not a terribly mature 23-year-old. I've always lagged behind in maturity. To this day... I haven't matured, not well anyway, not thoroughly, not well. And so um, I ran into him up there, and part of hanging around with Star, of course, was uh, partying. <laughs> and so I partied with Bill and learned about how to party and all this other stuff. And then I had a bad thing happen later on in that year. He'd already moved by that time he'd moved on, he was a nomad for quite a few years there. And uh, I was I was uh, out of pocket for uh, I was out of pocket for a couple of years. And I finally moved back to Wichita Falls in in, in nineteen uh, eighty that would have been late eighty one. I moved back to Wichita Falls and and with the intention of, of not staying, but I in fact I never actually unpacked my shit from having moved back, took me three or four years to get unpacked, as I, in my mind, I was leaving again. But as things turned out, I needed to finish my degree. And so Bill was in and out of town during that period of time from 81, oh, through, you know, for the next six or seven years, and stayed with me at my house when he was here in town and uh, was my roommate for quite a number of of years of total accumulated time so I got to know Bill pretty well and uh, uh, he and I remained close friends up until his death uh, four or five years ago and uh, it was uh, it was quite an interesting uh, experience hanging around with Bill. Bill was quite thoroughly a middle Atlantic boy he was from Maryland and he had a had the Maryland accent I picked up a little bit of it over the years just accidentally some of his Anytime you hang around with Bill Starr, you're going to end up talking like Starr. I don't know why that is, but it was part of the part of the deal. His little fucked up mannerisms and things. All of us that have hung around with him will all. Uh, those of you that are watching this or nodding your heads and laughing right now, because you. An of oh, I can't think of one right now. Uh, are you allowed to talk about it? Well, no. I, if I can think of, one, I, I've so thoroughly internalized them, I I can't really identify him as. <laughs> Is as his at this point, 
one of the funny things. He called halting deadlifts in his fucked up middle Atlantic accent. He called them hollies. <laughs> hollies. And what he was saying was haltings. But he didn't pronounce it haltings. He called haltings. And we thought he was saying hollies. But he was saying haltings without pronouncing the, the T. There's people from Maryland don't have the T sound in, in their vocabulary. Like the city is called Baltimore. It's not Baltimore. There's no T in Maryland. You don't use the word, the letter T in Maryland. So, uh, you know, there's several odd things like that. I, I, I've internalized it so thoroughly I can't separate it back out and even tell you one of the one of the examples. But those of you who knew Bill know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, important highlights uh, need to know from his book, Defying Gravity. Defying Gravity is was the first book ever written on how to compete in a weightlifting or powerlifting meet. And there are a bunch of good things in there for you to know, even in 2019. Now, that book's out of print. You can find a copy of it. Uh, it's pretty much just about competitive lifting, and I don't think that it's useful in terms of uh, of training for general strength and conditioning because that's not at all what it was about. The book was written to guide you in preparation for a meet and what to do at a meet. So it's it's pretty specific to that. And uh, there's some very good ideas in it, and you need, uh, if you're a competitive lifter, don't, just because it's old, don't dismiss it out of hand because there's a bunch of very good stuff in there, especially about the psychology of competitive lifting that you need to know, okay? All right, now here's uh, a question from Z. Ole. Rip, are there going to be starting strength gyms across the globe one day? Rip, are there going to be starting strength gyms across the globe one day? Well, someday, but it won't be soon. Um, we get this. I have this question for some reason twice a week. It comes up all the time. And uh, I understand that you guys that are international want a place to train. I understand that. And... Uh, Eventually, we will be in your market if your market is big enough to fulfill that demand. We will never be in rural India. We will never be in Antarctica. We probably will not have a starting strength gym in Tasmania or in the Northwest Territories or in Siberia or on the Russian steppes or in rural Argentina, these things are placed specifically in very large markets where we have a concentration of activity on our website. That's how we identify interest in the market. If, uh, if uh, the market is uh, in, in your area is a heavy user of the website, we know that there is a market for this product there. For example, at the, at the gym in Dallas, and Brent Carter's heading up the project for Starting Strength Dallas. That gym is just south of Carruth Haven on Greenville Avenue in a shopping center there. Uh, within three square miles, or with, I'm sorry, within a three-mile radius of, of that gym, there are 70,000 users of the website. That's how you locate the gym. Because we know that within within three miles that there's enough of you to sell 124 memberships to. And our aim in all of these things is not to, not to determine whether or not the market will bear it. We want to go into a market that we know there's a demand for this product. We will not put, for example, we won't put a starting strength gym in Wichita Falls, Texas. It's too small. It's a hundred thousand market. A hundred thousand market is not big enough to to support the franchise model of this gym. Uh, Wichita Falls Athletic Club will remain a starting strength affiliate gym and not a starting strength franchise gym. There will be no starting strength Wichita Falls. 
But there is a starting strength Dallas, and it'll be open the what is it, the fifth of July? Is that what the date is? I think July five is the is the uh, is the target date. So here pretty soon, and uh, uh, we determine uh, where to put these things from web traffic. Uh, here's an interesting thing that we've noticed over the years. We don't have hardly any web traffic from, nor do we sell any books into Spanish-speaking markets. Now, I don't know why that is, but we've, we, we've sold a handful of books uh, because we ship them from, from uh, here in Wichita Falls. We ship internationally. We sell the same books that Amazon sells. We don't have Amazon's sales data, but our data in terms of uh, where you guys that are buying these books are uh, indicates to us that the, the Spanish-speaking market is a, is, is a low-demand, low-priority deal. And uh, there will, you know, in the absence of a, a giant turnaround in, in, uh, in sales or in activity from those destinations on our website, we're probably not going to a Spanish-speaking country anytime soon. Ten years from now, that could be different. We are planning a Spanish language translation. And uh, that should be ready, oh, probably by the end of this year, but uh, maybe not even that, that quickly, but it is in process. But in terms of actually moving uh, starting strength franchise gyms into uh, foreign locations, not foreign to you, foreign to us, right? Uh, it'll be a while. We don't even do seminars overseas right now because of the logistical problems with uh, staffing and transportation and lodging and expense and what we'd have to charge for it and what you'll actually pay us to do it, these sort of things, make overseas seminars very, very hard to do right now. So as is currently the case, you're going to have to fly to us if you want what we've got. Uh, 20 years from now, things will probably be completely different. But in answer to the question, it's going to be a while, Okay. Here's Anonymous showing back up again. Maybe that's just a popular first name. You think that's what it is? Is there any job or career that you would recommend in which someone would work not for themselves but for someone else? I ask because I know you talked about your father owning his own restaurant and you're a business owner and entrepreneur. Somehow I can't see you having a boss in the traditional corporate organization chart sense of the word. I think I know the answer to this, but it'd be interesting to hear it. Well, I don't know that you do know the answer to that because I've got some, some interesting thoughts on that. All right. Some professions are not conducive to self-employment, especially now. Okay. And case in point, I went to school to be a petroleum geologist. All right, things uh, were slow about 12, 13 years ago, and I was having trouble at the gym making ends meet, and I had considered going back into the oil business. So I uh, started going down to the Oil Information Library here in Wichita Falls, which is quite an organization, Wichita Falls being at one point the independent oil capital of the world, more independent producers here than anywhere else in the world, and was so for 20 or 30 years. Uh, there's a lot of old oil money here, a lot of oil activity, a lot of oil field activity in the immediate area. This is traditionally an oil town. And uh, I had thought maybe I'd get back in that, in that profession, so I started hanging around down at the Oil Information Library and trying to put some deals together, and it became rapidly apparent to me that the industry had changed to the point that self-employment in the absence of a lot of capital, a lot of, of capital was going to be extremely difficult for an exploration petroleum geologist. And uh, it, it, just, it just wasn't going to be in the cards. I wasn't going to be able to work for myself. I was going to have to get a job with an established firm uh, I lacked sufficient 
experience to actually do that, to actually have a resume to show somebody, and I would have wa- walked into the situation low man on the totem pole uh, because of the nature of the work. Uh, the oil business is a capital-intensive industry, and even at the even at the low independent levels of oil exploration and production, it's millions and millions and millions of dollars are in, are involved in virtually everything you do. And a guy that doesn't have any kind of history in the business is not going to just open an office. It just doesn't work that way. And so about that time, uh, the book took off and uh, started helping me uh, – making a living at the gym and I had the gym became the minor source of income and things became kind of on the road to where they are right now. And I gradually just abandoned the idea of getting back in the oil business. Although I am intensely interested in, in geology and petroleum geology. And I remain, I remain. So in fact, those of you that have been in my massage room have seen my room in the middle where I've got my little massage table where I work on a couple of people every once in a while, uh, will notice that on the walls are a bunch of cross sections and a whole bunch of geology stuff and oil well information and stuff like that. I just keep there because I like it. But there are professions, to answer your question, that self-employment is not a, especially if you're trying to walk into an established industry or they just don't lend themselves to self-employment especially a new guy wandering in. Fortunately, strength and conditioning is not one of those professions. You can make a, 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 a big splash in the business by yourself. If you are real good at this, you don't have to work for a firm. You can work for yourself. There's countless other examples of that. And if you are like me, uh, an asshole hard to get along with, pig-headed, stubborn, stupid, blind, prone to what? Uh, irrational bursts of inventive behavior. You're my boss. I'm not going to answer this. I'm not your boss. Nick's your boss. I'm just, I just own the gym. Uh, the... You, you don't need to, to be trying to piss up a rope. If the, if the industry you're trying to go into is not, if it's capital intensive and you don't have the capital, you can't work for yourself. And uh, depending on uh, what you want to do, uh, you may have to tailor your ambition to be more congruent with what you know your personality to be. And that's just the way things are. Okay. Fred Barnes asks, would performing the LNP, he means the NLP, the Novice Linear Progression, of course, this is a typo, right? For Masters athletes, twice weekly be detrimental to overall strength acquisition compared to the standard three times a week. Fred has not read the barbell prescription, has he? Because we actively recommend that older people, I mean old, older people, just, just do this twice a week. Twice a week's just fine. If you're 70 years old, you don't need to be trying to do this three days a week. You're not going to recover from it. It's not, it's not going to be um, uh, accessible to you. Uh, Three-day-a-week training is just not accessible to a 70, 75-year-old person. Uh, if you're 50, you, certainly you can do it. Uh, but most 70, 75-year-old people don't have any business trying to train three days a week. Uh, and there's a gray area in there, somewhere between 50 and 75. I don't know where you are, Fred, but uh, uh, if I'd probably go ahead and start. At, if you're under the age of 60, I think I'd probably start three days a week and see how you deal with it. And if it works, then keep doing it. If it's too much to recover from, you're sore, beat up, tired all the time, not sleeping good because you're hurting, sore, tired, all that shit. Don't do it three times a week. Cut back to twice a week. You're doing way, way better than uh, everybody you graduated high school with. Okay? Jack Patterson asks, You stated in Axe Rip 67 
that you ruptured a patellar tendon ACL graft in 2002. Yes, I did. I've done the exact same thing. I just had revision surgery using a quadricep graft, this time from the same knee. Did you have a revision surgery for your injury, and what advice do you have for rehabbing this type of injury? I did not have my uh, graft repaired. Uh, uh, let's see. In 2002, I was already uh, – I was in my late 40s, and I had that thing first repaired in 94. That's when I had the wreck in 94, and it had, it had been in there, uh, you know, like six or eight years when I kept having a bunch of problems with it. And I was, you know, in my, def in my defense, I was, uh, uh, I was young and strong, even in my 40s, I was a vicious human being. I was playing soccer and injured it. Uh, injured the graft the first time. Felt something pop in the thing in that knee. I was playing soccer and I was playing soccer fairly effectively, but I uh, uh, heard it then. And then I finished rupturing the thing at 02, stepping down off of a tall horse onto a rock. And uh, that thing, he was 16 two hands. Big, nice bay horse. And I had to get off of him on the side of a hill real in a, in a hurry. I had to get off in a hurry for various reasons. And I stepped on a round rock. My knee just popped sideways, and then it was, it was gone. Re-ruptured the whole thing. And uh, subsequent examination of the thing uh, revealed that the the graft was gone. In other words, I don't have an ACL in my right knee. An ACL graft, uh, a regraft of that thing, was going to be a giant pain in the ass. If I was going to have it done, I would have had an allograft done because they repaired that with an autograft the first time. It was the uh, patellar tendon autograft where they harvest the middle part of your patella tendon and then shape it and... and uh, uh, replace your ACL with that. That's the thing that ruptured. So I've had a bunch of knee revisions uh, on my right knee. But honestly, knowing what I know now, had, had I known enough at the time to understand this, I probably would not have had the ACL repaired the first time. Uh, now, what restrictions do I have in terms of my activities with no ACL in my right knee? Well, I don't jump out of the back of the truck anymore, all right? I don't do box jumps or stupid shit like that, but I wasn't going to do that anyway. But I have to be careful getting down because the knees, at some level, it's unstable. The thing scars down eventually and produces some stability, but it's not original equipment anymore. It's not as stable. But depending how old you are, it, it may be that the repair surgery is not uh, what you want to put yourself through. Now, I'll, I'll tell you this. I remember being in the hospital after that surgery in, uh, back in 94, and uh, back then my parents were alive, and I was, was in the hospital, and I had uh, uh, a lot of pain with that thing. And I mean, you people that say you're in uh, eight-level pain, you know, you walk in the doctor's office, and he says, on a scale of one to ten, what do you – what do you think your pain is? And he said, oh, eight or nine. You know, with a perfectly straight face, you say, eight or nine. No, <laughs> you don't understand. <laughs> I remember the third day after that surgery and all the medication had worn off and they had thankfully prescribed a couple of uh, injections of uh, I am Toradol for this. And I remember being in, <laughs> being in the room, and my mother and dad are standing at the end of the bed, and that thing was hurting more and hurting more and hurting more. And I went into a convulsion. I mean, a, 
you know, slobbering all over everything, uncontrolled shaking and shit. And my mother really did not react well to that. And uh, they went out and got the nurse, and and uh, I mean, that's how bad it hurt. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't talk. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't keep from shaking. And the nurse brought in a CC of IM toward all and rolled me over on my butt and stuck that in my ass. And eh, that that's amazing how quickly that works. Well, you've ever seen that happen, but it's it's amazing how quickly IM Toradol will fix something like that. It's a it's an injectable NSAID. It's not a it's not a uh, it's not an opioid analgesic. It's an NSAID, and I mean it shut the thing down and it immediately began to where I could breathe, you know. But that's how my point is. That's how bad it hurt. Okay, do not overestimate your ability to deal with pain like that, especially if you're like me, someone who does not respond at all to opioid analgesics. Uh, in other words, uh, dilaudid, oral dilaudid doesn't do anything to me. And if I was going to have that graft repaired, I just did not know if I was going to be able to deal with, with, the pain management situation, so I just opted not to do it. Uh, you know, likewise, my shoulder, my right shoulder, probably needs uh, some work on the cuff tendon. I don't think I'm going to do it unless it just gets to the point where I can't because it just hurts too goddamn bad. It just hurts too goddamn bad. I hurt all the time anyway, and I just don't want to deal with it. So as long as it's okay, I'm just going to sit here, okay? So... uh there are my thoughts on that. Uh, William Harrell says, would a neutral grip chin-up pull-up serve in place of a more traditional underhand grip chin-up? Well, it depends on if you want your biceps involved in the movement. It would if all you want to train is your triceps and your lats and your scapular retractors and stuff like that. But then, here, look at this. I know it's the size of this bicep is upsetting some of you people. And I do have big, beautiful arms. Ronnie Coleman one time told me that, God, Ripto, you got nicer arms than I do. He didn't say that. He should have, though. So if you want your biceps involved, in the movement pattern, you got to do a supine grip chin up. If you don't care, do them any other way you want to. But that's what's involved. Supination is what pulls the bicep into the movement. If you want, if you want your biceps trained, you got to supinate. Here's anonymous again. Do you realize that there are one, two, three, four, five questions on this list from anonymous? Don't take any more questions from that guy. Okay. Uh, says, how do you optimize the program from the recovery perspective? To allow for training in other sport alongside strength training. Of course, strength helps other sports, but it's, impo but it's possible to do too much and not leave enough room to recover. Well, yes, it is anonymous, depending on your level of training advancement. Okay, now, if you're an advanced lifter, and you've gone through all of our programming, and you are uh, on the top end of the bell curve where the thing's beginning to tail out. And you decide, you know, I'm going to start playing rugby as an adult, and you're stupid enough to do something like that, all right? As an advanced lifter, you're going to have to make some compromises in terms of both rugby and your training if you want to do both things, all right? Because, you know, at that level, things are hard to recover from. By definition, advanced lifting is hard, and uh, it's a bunch of work. And if you want to do uh, add rugby to your schedule, you're going to have to go back to some level of intermediate programming, uh, an abbreviated level of intermediate programming, uh, if you're going to add another sport like rugby to your to your day, but let's here's a more uh, common 
situation. The kid's a sophomore in high school. He's, what, 15, 16 years old. He's a sophomore in high school. He's been uh, just dicking around in the weight room, you know, not doing anything in particular and playing football, right? And the reason he's been dicking around in the weight room while he's playing football is because his football coach is in charge of the weight room and they don't know how to do anything but dick around. Okay, so you're not really doing strength training if you're in, in, in the football weight room because, you know, the chances are, are 99 out of 100 that your football coach hadn't got the slightest idea what we're even talking about today, all right? Now, if you do the novice linear progression correctly as a 16-year-old kid and you eat enough and you go to bed at night – you should be able to add five pounds of workout to your squat three days a week in addition to football practice because football practice is not that hard and strength training at that level is not that hard if you're eating enough. So if you're a kid, you don't have to make allowances for sports practice while you're doing the novice linear progression because, in fact, the increase in strength that you're going to experience while you're doing strength training for the first time is going to more than make up for the, the fatigue that you accumulate on the field during practice. If you're eating enough food, you'll get recovered from all of it and you'll be better on the field and in the weight room all at the same time because the recovery capacity of a kid that age is truly astonishing if you will eat. But you won't eat, will you? No, you won't eat. You won't eat breakfast. You won't get up in time to make yourself a bunch of eggs and eat them for breakfast along with some oatmeal and some toast. And you won't have a good lunch in the school cafeteria because either you can't have a good lunch in the school cafeteria or you won't make plans to do so. And your chances are the first anything you're going to eat is going to be after school, and by that time you're already in a deficit that you can't get out of in terms of the number of calories and the amount of protein that you're going to need. So you're not going to eat. So under those circumstances, since you're not going to do what you need to do, to get recovered from both of those, you can't do both. And as a result, you'll never leave up to your potential in either one of those things because you won't do the program. You won't do what you're supposed to do. Okay? So keep that in mind. Now, what is the chain around your neck? Anonymous again, if advanced lifters do rack pulls and board bench presses, why is no one doing half squats? They, uh, <laughs> the answer is they are doing half squats. <laughs> you, haven't, you haven't seen any APF meat videos on the Internet? All right. Okay. Anonymous again. Can you talk about the preferred body weight height ratio for strength training? How do you decide if you need to gain more weight, maintain, and just keep training, or cut because you're a fat slob? Well, that doesn't really have anything to do with your height, though, does it? Now, if you are a competitive lifter, then I think it's important to, to be aware of a couple of things. Uh, for example, in the 181-pound weight class, and, you know, and you just translate that into whatever the modern weight classes are at IPF because I don't have any idea. They keep changing them because they think they're going to be in the Olympics and they keep trying to stay in line with the Olympic lifters and they keep changing because metal count considerations, all this other shit. So let's just look at the traditional weight classes. The 181-pound uh, weight class, how tall are the guys in a 181-pound weight class at the world's? Well, they're about 5'4", all right? Uh, there have been several attempts to make an analysis of this, of this, and I think I've seen recommendations of anywhere from 4 to 5 pounds 
of body weight per inch of height. And that's assuming a normal body composition of 15 to 18% body fat. And uh, this indicates that if you're six foot tall, you need to weigh probably 275. Uh, if you're going to lift the heaviest weights. But that was not your question, was it? Your question was about strength training. And for strength training, you need to be as strong as you find the time to get, as much time as you can devote to this. If you're not a competitive lifter and you're not trying to get huge and powerful, you just want to be a little stronger, be aware of the fact you're going to gain some weight. You need to gain some weight, probably, that an increase in strength also represents an increase in muscle mass. And you already know if you're a fat slob, okay? I don't need to tell you whether you're a fat slob. I will say that if you're at 20% body fat, nobody can honestly consider you a fat slob. You're not a fat slob at 20% body fat. You're not a fat slob at 22% body fat, all right? You're probably a fat slob at 30% body fat, all right? But does a reduction in body fat percentage from 30 to 20% represent the kind of investment of time and heartache and uh, missed opportunities that, that equate to a good life? I don't know. That's just going to be your call, right? That's your decision. If you hate your belly bad enough to go on a cut to do it, then go on the cut. Fine with me. I don't care. I don't care that I'm 24% body fat or whatever the hell I am right now. I just don't care. I don't count macros. I don't count, uh, I, you know, I eat a lot of protein, but I don't really have a good handle on my body weight. It stayed fairly stable. It edges up a little bit. But, uh, I, you know, at 5'8", I'm probably weighing 230, 235. And I'm comfortable I'm not interested in doing the things I would need to do to get down to 200 pounds. I don't want to be 200 pounds. I don't mind weighing 230 uh, because I'm just strength training right now. I'm not a competitor. I will tell you that the biggest mistake I made when I was a competitor was not going up to 242. I got some very bad advice from my coach and uh, who was – half bodybuilder at the time, and uh, I should have been 242 at 5'8", to even start to lift the most weights that I could lift. Uh, Ed Cohen lifted at 242, and he's 5'5", because he was not burdened with this bad advice that I got on this. So uh, I think that uh, for... Uh, strength and conditioning pur purposes, I think you would probably, uh, if you know if you're a fat slob and you need to, to lift weights I, and lose weight. Uh, the article, a clarification on my website, deals with exactly this topic. I would advise you to look that up. Okay. And last, Dave wants to know, in some of your older vi pic videos and pictures, you're wearing shorts. But for the last few years, you only seem to be wearing Carhartt pants. Why don't you wear shorts anymore? Dave, why are you paying so much attention to my pants? Uh, all right, that aside, let me, let me point out something, Dave. I'm 63. 63-year-old 63 men don't need to be wearing shorts, okay? They just, they just don't, all right? Uh my calves are two different sizes since my patellar, since my Achilles tendon rupture back in 2000. And I look stupid standing there in shorts with one calf smaller than the other. I got those old man legs where all the hairs rubbed off of the bottom of your calves, you know. Old men, old men just, I, you don't want to see me in shorts. I don't want to see me in shorts. Nobody wants to see me in shorts. I look okay naked, but I look stupid in shorts. And you do, too. Keep that in mind. All right? Thanks for joining us on the podcast again. We'll talk at you next time.